I don't know. Anyhow, um, I'm just happy to be here. So, a um, few items before we get started. Number one, please remember to take the exam. Okay? Um, if you are in my hybrid class, the exam is available today through Monday, and you need to be in the door by Monday at 8 p.m. If you're in the online class, the exam has been available for the last five weeks and is available through Tuesday. At, and again, you need to be it's at the testing center, and you need to be there in the door no later than 8. That's when they shut the doors, but they, they don't kick people out until 9. And most people finish the exam in under an hour, so that's not a big deal. The format's exactly the same as the last one. It's on Canvas. It's multiple choice. You can't take any notes. You can't take any books. It's all by memory. Take a calculator so you can do your square roots. And um, it's longer. The last test had 66 questions. This one has 80 questions. The reason for that is because each of the exam, and the final exam is longer still at 97. The reason for that is because they're cumulative. The first 20 questions on this exam come from material on the first exam. They're not identical to them, but they're very, very similar. And the way I did that is uh, a while ago, I had a couple of sections that took the, the exam, and I just picked the 20 hardest questions from the first exam. Now, what that means, it's actually really easy to tell. All you got to do is go back to your exam. You can get on Canvas, and you can see what questions you missed. Expect those to show up again. So all you need to do is go and see what you missed. Make sure you're comfortable with that stuff. And then you should be good on the first 20 questions. The uh, remaining 60 questions are 20 for each of the three chapters, 6, 7, and 8. And um, yeah. I do adjust the distribution of scores if the, if the highest non-outline score is not a perfect score. But that I usually don't have to do that. It usually I get uh, you know, a, a few people who can get 80 out of 80 on this exam. Uh, doesn't happen on the final. I always adjust the final. Um, and one more thing, please remember, just in case the first exam did not go the way you wanted it to, if you get a better grade on this exam, percentage-wise, if you get a better grade on this exam, it will replace your first exam score. And the same thing's true of the final. If you do better on the final than either exam one or exam two, it will replace that lower score. Now, it doesn't go the other way. Earlier better scores do not replace later worse scores. It's only later better ones replace earlier worse ones. So, again, so if you, if you bombed a, an exam, it really is not the end of the world. Um, so that's that's all I got to say about that. Any questions about the exam? Aside from the material that we're going to cover, just logistics. Okay. I guess I'm supposed to turn this sideways. We're gonna make our document cam really big in a minute. Um, shall we get started? Okay. What I want to do is talk about chapter 6, then 7, then 8. And then, if we, can we uh, zoom back out a little bit on the document cam, please? So I can just see where the top and the bottom, whoa, out of focus. Okay, thank you. So, um, Let's just try to do 6, then 7, then 8, and then, if you want to, we can go back and, and do stuff from 1 through 5. Okay? And, and we have to quit at exactly, we cannot go past 8 o'clock. They, they actually cut us off. All right? All right. So, Chapter 6, which is about sampling distributions. Do you guys have any questions about that? I find it very difficult. It's because it is difficult. To get that in, and my students are noticeable. Mm -hmm. It's to a certain extent it's principle. I mean, I know it's principle what you're doing, mm -hmm. but it does sound a bit. Okay. Here's the basic principle. 
Oh, yeah, use the mic. You've got mics. Do they have to press the button? There you go. Okay, so just the general principle. Now, do we have any more specific questions about um, Chapter 6? No, because nobody knows where to start with the specific questions. Okay, here's the basic idea. Ready? What you have is a distribution of scores. Let's label that X. Okay, so this is a distribution of raw scores. It's um, whatever it is you're measuring. And it's, it's scores for individuals, one person or one observation at a time. And each one goes in there, boop, 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 and you end up with this distribution. Maybe it's a bell curve. On the other hand, what we're going to be doing now is sampling from that distribution. Let me put this here. Original distribution, individual scores. It's an original distribution of individual scores. Usually a person, but you know, whatever you're dealing with. So now what we do, I got lots of colored markers here, so this is good. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start sampling a few people at a time. So for instance, let's sample five people. Ready? There's five people that maybe we could pick. Now you see, well, it's true that these are all on the left side of the distribution. Let's just assume that they're drawn at random, okay? And then what I can do is I can calculate the mean of that set of five scores. So it's going to be, you know, like right there, okay? And then what I do is I come over here and I create a second distribution. But instead of charting X, it's not going to be X. Instead, what it's going to be is the mean of X. Because that's what I'm going to calculate in this particular situation. I'm going to get my five scores. I'm going to calculate the mean for each of them. I could use other statistics. I could, I could get the uh, interquartile range for the five scores. I could get the variance for the five scores. I could get whatever I wanted for the five scores. But the mean's the most common. So I get the mean for those five scores, and then I come over here, and I put that mean. Uh, let me let me just mark this off a little bit. So there's the there's the center of the distribution. There's the same center right there. So I'm going to put my little thing right here. Okay. So that's the mean that I just got. So I took five individual scores. I calculated a summary statistic for them. In this case, the mean. And then I charted that one number, the summary statistic, over here to take the place of the five numbers, right? So I'm condensing. I'm sampling. I chose a sample of five scores, got my summary statistic, and then I enter that over here as a data point. Now let's do the same thing again. Let's get five other scores. One, two, three, four, five. That's supposed to be green. Um, and that mean is going to be lower, but it's going to be really close to like right there, okay? I'm just guessing. And so what I then do is I come over here and put a dot for the green distribution, right? So again, what I've done is I've sampled five scores at random from this distribution of individual scores. I calculated a summary statistic, and then I take that one number that I got from my summary statistic, that's the mean in this case, and I put it over here as a data point. And you can tell because this is a chart of means. This is a chart of original scores. This is a chart of means of scores. All right, let's do it again. This one may not show up. There's a yellow, and I've got five about right there. Let's do it one more time. Let's do um, brown. And you know, maybe the mean for brown is about right there. Okay, so you see what's happening here? 
I've chosen a sample size. I have to choose this. The sample size has to be consistent for this to work. It can be whatever you want. It just has to be the same each time you draw a sample. So I chose five. And so I get my first five and I get the mean. I chart that over here. I get my second five. I get the mean. I chart that over here. My third set of five, put it over here. My fourth set of five, put it over here. And guess what? You can do this an infinite number of times. And once you've done that, you're not going to end up with little dots here on the ground anymore. Things are going to start stacking up, right? The same way they do over here. And what you're going to end up with is a distribution. So we have a distribution right here. That's the curve right there. We're going to have a distribution over here, too. And it's going to be a distribution of sample means. Okay? So it's a second order process. It's one step removed from the original data because now you have original data, then we get sample statistics, then we chart that stuff. Okay. There's a reason that this is important. And it's because this is what allows us to do inferential statistics. This is what allows us to make inferences about samples and the populations that they came from. So this is the key. We can't do the rest of this course unless we have this process. Now, we're not going to go through this process, but this is, this is the foundation of it. Now, this right here, once we've gone through this process, is called a sampling distribution. And that makes sense because we went through a sampling process to get the information for it, right? We sampled five scores, put the sample statistic over here, sampled five more scores, put it over here, and we do that repeatedly. So this is a sampling distribution. And there's a few things that you know about the sampling distribution based on something called the central limit theorem, which is going to show up on the test. You guys remember reading that term? Okay, central limit theorem, let's write that down. Central limit theorem, often just called CLT. It tells us three things. Do you guys remember what those three things are? I'll, I'll tell you. It tells us three things about this distribution. Okay, what are they? It tells you the mean. Yeah, it gives you the mean of this distribution. Okay, now ready? The mean, uh, you mark it. This is a population. Even though it's made up of sample observations, because it's every single possible sample combination, it's a, it's a population. And so like a population, you know, here we have, we mark it with a mu because it's a population mean. Now, this screws people up sometimes. I'm going to put a little x there to indicate that that's the population mean for the original x scores. You don't have to normally put that. That's implied. And here I have a population mean also. But this one is the population mean of sample means. It sounds contradictory. Okay? But it's not because it describes the process of how you got it. So it's the population mean of every possible sample mean of five scores at a time. It's specific to the sample size. If I did six scores at a time, it would be different. If I did seven scores at a time, it would be different. This is for five at a time. So the first thing it tells us is the mean of the sampling distribution. Do you remember what it's equal to? Yeah, it's just original to this same thing over here. They're centered on the same value. That's why I, I use the subscript to see that. So the, the mean of the sampling distribution is equal to the mean of the original population. OK? OK. The uh, central limit theorem tells us two other things. Do you remember what they are? Yeah, the shape. It says that the shape of the sampling distribution regardless of the shape of the original population. Now, I drew a nice little bell curve here, but you know it can be different shapes. It can look like, it can look like that, or it can look like 
that, or it can look like that. You know, there's a lot of different possible shapes, right? Regardless of the shape of the original distribution, if your sample is sufficiently large, if your sample size is sufficiently large, then the shape approaches a bell curve. Now, sufficiently large depends on the shape. If you start with a bell curve, sufficiently large is just one observation at a time. And, and all you're doing then is you're just like transposing the distribution. Nothing changes. If it's a really weird distribution, you know, like this second one, you have to have more observations for it to sort of kick in. Um, but the reason that's really important is because a distribution like this one, this kind of crazy shaped, I can't make any predictions about it. I can't tell you what percentage of it is between zero and one standard deviations. But I can do that for the normal distribution. We know the normal distribution really well. And that's why we can do probability calculations because we take a crazy distribution and by going through the sampling process, as long as our sample's reasonably large, we end up with a very well behaved and very well understood normal distribution that allows us to make inferential probability statements. Okay? It's because we know about this one. We know how it works. This one we don't. All right, there's one other thing it tells us, the central limit theorem. Right, the standard deviation. So let's say this is the mean right here. Do, 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 do. There's the standard deviation. I'll do the same thing over here. And you remember that the standard deviation for a population, we use that little, uh, it's a lowercase sigma. Well, we have the same thing over here. I'll draw it bigger. The difference is this. Ready? This is the standard deviation of the distribution of original x scores, right? That's why I put my little x right there. This one, you, you remember how instead of putting an x, I put an x bar down here? I do the same thing right there. So, the standard deviation of this distribution, it tells us about that. Do you guys know? There's a formula to calculate this one. Do you remember what it is? It's a really simple formula. Standard deviation. Yep. Correct. So what you do is you take the original standard deviation from over here. And you divide it by the square root of the sample size. Here I was using 5, so my, my standard deviation is going to be, oh geez, what's the square root of 5? It's like 2.2, something like that, right? The double, the double, the double standard deviation sign has to be, does that happen there? You know what, it can, it can it, because it can just to keep things clear, so you know that this is this. Yeah. yeah. Now here's the deal. This one over here is a standard deviation, right? It's the standard deviation of this population distribution. However, we don't call it the standard deviation. It has a different name because it's for the sampling distribution. This is where you can get a little messed up here. It's called, do you remember what it's called? the standard error. This is the standard deviation. Let's put that down as standard deviation. This is called the standard error. That would be with an OR at the end. It's the standard error. And when you talk about the standard error, that means the standard deviation of a sampling distribution. Okay. And you can calculate that value by taking the original standard deviation and divided by the square root of the sample size. Now, there's a way to remember the standard deviation versus the standard error. And this is something that I made up. But it, it works this way. And again, if you were in my hybrid class, you heard this explanation already. And actually, I talk about this on the video too, I believe. 
but it works this way. In statistics, words often have different meanings than they have in everyday use. One interesting one is the word deviation. In everyday colloquial use, deviation is a bad thing. You talk about deviant behavior, that's something that gets you in trouble. But in statistics, deviation simply means that two scores are not the same, that they're just different from each other. It's a value-free term. The scores just aren't equal. We don't expect them to be equal. Not everybody here in the same height. That doesn't mean that we've done something wrong. We're just different from each other, right? And so you can get the mean of the height for everybody in here, and you can find out whether a person is above or below that by a certain amount. That's a deviation. Standard means average. So standard deviation means average difference from the mean, okay? With the sampling distribution, however, it becomes value-laden. The reason for that is a sample, and although it's a mathematical abstraction, a sample has a moral responsibility to accurately represent the population that it came from. Because you're using the sample to make inferences about the population, you've got to just cross your fingers and hope that your sample is representative. If your sample is not representative, you know, sometimes it happens by fluke, but that's not very often. More often, you'll have bias. If you have a bias sample, is a bad sample. It will mislead you. It leads you into an error. It creates errors. It makes mistakes. And so the standard error you think of it, an error in this term, in this situation, means you messed up or the sample misled you. And so you can think about standard errors being the average error or the average mistake. How far is the sample mean from the population mean that it's supposed to be representing? Okay? So that's how I remember the term standard deviation and standard error. In this case, deviation just means that they're different from each other, but error means mistake. All right? So, we've got our original population with its mean and standard deviation. We go through a sampling process and we create this second distribution. It's called a uh, sampling distribution with, this, with its standard deviation, which is called a standard error. And then we have the central limit theorem, which tells us the mean of the uh, sampling distribution, which is just equal to the original mean. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution, or the standard error, which is the standard deviation of this one divided by the square root of the sample size. And that's why you can see if the sample size were different, that, that, well, that tells you, number one, the sample size needs to be consistent all the way through because we're dividing just by a single number here. And obviously, if the sample size were different, then you would end up with a different number. If we divide by 5, the square root of 5, then we get something that if we divide by the square root of 500, yeah, it's going to change. And then finally, the shape. With a large enough sample size, whatever the shape of this original one, the sampling distribution will come to resemble a, a normal distribution, which is really handy and makes life easy. Okay. Um, I'm going to add something to make it slightly more complicated. Let me uh, just push this one up for a minute. There we go. Bring this one in beneath it. So you, central, you see, we've got the central limit theorem right here. Take a quick look at that first one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that down here again. Okay, so what this says, I see I got just copied number one, right? It says the mean of the sampling distribution for sample means is equal to the mean of the original population of scores, right? Guess what, though? You can make a sampling distribution for things other than the mean. For instance, when I do statistics in this program that I use for professional work called SPSS, it gives me a standard error for skewness and kurtosis. It just does that all the time. So let's try this one. Let's say I did. Instead of the mean, I did kurtosis, which we'll just write with K, all right? So the mean for the sampling distribution of values of kurtosis is not going to be equal to the mean of the original population because that's, they're different statistics. What it's going to be equal to, though, 
is the value of kurtosis for the original population. You see? This is the original population's statistic, the one I'm interested in, and so that is what this is here. So if I'm making a sampling distribution of kurtosis values, so let's come back to this one just for a moment. So I'm right here, and instead of calculating the mean for these five red numbers, I calculate their kurtosis. Then I chart that over here. And I do the same thing for the five yellow numbers. I get the value of kurtosis. It's going to be centered not around the mean, but it's going to be centered around the value of kurtosis for this distribution. It's a little tricky. I think that question only shows up once, and if you just randomly guess, you have a 25% chance of getting it right. Correct? Um, so don't, don't lose sleep over it. But the point is, you can make a sampling distribution for lots of different statistics, and that distribution will be centered on whatever that statistic is that you're calculating from the original population. Don't worry about it. Probably shouldn't have brought it up. <laughs> it, except it does show up in one question. Okay. All right. So that's the sampling process. Oh, let, let me just show you. So, for instance, let's say instead of uh, let's say I did the standard deviation of a sample. Then the mean of the sampling distribution of standard deviations would be equal to the population standard deviation of the original scores. Let's say I did IQRs. Then the mean of the sampling distribution of IQRs would be equal to the IQR of the original distribution of X scores. So there's a correspondence. You can see how it just kind of moves over. That's how that works. Okay. That's the sampling distribution. What next? Do I get to use my 30-second lull rule in here? In review sessions, if there's a 30-second lull, we're done. Yeah. I just had general questions on. Is it green? It is green. Okay, cool. Um, just going through some of, like, looking at the quiz questions, uh -huh. just walking through some of your actual, um, when you give us a given size, a population, and just working through those equations with us. Maybe just okay. once to just review, make sure. We can sure. run through one of those. Now, you have looked at the quiz review videos, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Give me some numbers and we'll run through one, okay? So we're going to do quiz. Uh, what chapter? Chapter uh, This is six? chapter six. It's quiz number one. Six. And it's going to be quiz, okay, it's chapter six, quiz number one, and what question? It's number three. It's just one of the first examples. All right, what's it say? If a test has a population mean of 70. Okay, wait, population mean. Mm -hmm. So if a test has a population mean of 70. And a standard deviation of six. Standard deviation for the population of six. And what is the Z score for a sample of nine scores? Okay, and we get a sample of nine scores. With a mean of 76. And a mean of 76. So we've got four numbers here, and we're going to use those to calculate a z-score for that sample mean. Okay. First thing you need to do is remember the z-score formula. Go like this. Z is equal. Now, you remember this one? This is how we wrote it for a single score, right? You should remember this. You get how far is the score from the mean, and that's the deviation. That's the deviation for that score. And then you divide by the standard deviation. So how much deviation do you observe in that score versus what do you expect on average? We only have to make a couple of very small modifications to use this for a sample instead of an individual score. First thing we do is we make that a sample mean. So we're going to find the deviation or the difference between the sample mean and the population mean. And then here, instead of comparing it to the standard deviation, we're going to compare it to 
a standard error because we're looking at something about sample statistics. Okay. One other thing you need to remember is that this number here on the bottom has its own formula. We mentioned this a moment ago. Okay, just take the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So let's do that first. The standard deviation, the thing that goes in the numerator, is right here. It's 6. And then we're going to divide by the square root of n, which in this case is 9. So our sample size is 9 scores at a time. So 6 divided by the square root of 9, which is 3. 6 divided by 3 is 2. That is our standard error. It's not our z-score. It's just one step in getting the z-score. But that's the one that we're going to put in the denominator for the z-score. It's going to go up here. So now we can do this part. Let's come back over here. We need our sample mean, which is 76, right? And we compare it to the population mean, which is 70. And then we're going to look at that difference between the two, and we're going to divide it by the average distance for samples from the population mean, and that's the standard error of 2. So 76 minus 70 is you know, 6, divided by 2, and we, oops, I'm going to, 3. That sample has a z-score of 3. So does anybody know 3 what? It's, 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 it's 3 of something. Three standard errors. What this means is that the sample mean is three standard errors above the population mean, which, by the way, is a lot. Because remember, when we did z-scores, it told you how many standard deviations a, a person was above or below the mean. Now it's telling us how many standard errors the sample's mean is above or below the population mean. So this means, because it's positive, it means it's above. And you can tell 76 is bigger than 70. And it's three standard errors. And if it's in a normal distribution, then we actually can make some good inferences about this. Because three standard errors in a normal distribution means something. It means an ex a very unlikely thing to happen by chance or a very unusual score. Does that work? You want to do another? All right. What's the next one? You know what? I'll get, I'll get a clean sheet. Okay. So here's a quiz question. It's from Chapter 6. Oh, thanks. Um, this might be a little different. This is from okay. quiz number two. Okay. And it. Quiz two. Question number. Oh, here's a similar one. Question number five. Question number five. Okay, what does it say? Um, it's so, giving. Chapter six, quiz number two, question number five. It's giving the mean uh -huh. 30, standard deviation of three. Okay, wait, wait, start over. Read the question. If a distribution has a mean of 30. Okay, if a distribution has a mean of 3? 30. 30. Standard deviation of 3. A standard deviation of 3. Then what is the z-score for a sample of 4 scores? Okay, n is equal to 4. With a mean of 27. 27. Okay, so we have... Four numbers, and we need to calculate the fifth. So we have the population mean is 30, the population standard deviation is 3, sample size is 4, and the sample mean is 27. And so what we're trying to find out is we're going to get a z-score that will tell us how many standard errors this mean, sample mean, is from this population mean. Right? If it's positive, it means it's above the population mean. If it's negative, it means it's below. 
and the absolute value of the number tells us how many standard errors. That's our metric. Okay. So let's use our same formula. Is that big enough for you guys to see? Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't want to go any smaller. Standard error is equal to the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. The standard deviation uh, we were given is 3. And then we divide by the square root of the sample size, n. That's equal to 4. So 3 the square, divided by the square root of 4, which is 2. 3 divided by 2 is 1.5. That's the standard error, right? Again, it's not the z-score, but it goes into getting the z-score. Now we come back over here to this formula. We need the sample mean, which is 27. That's something that we were given. We subtract the population mean. That's 30. And we divide by the standard error, which we just calculated over here. That's 1.5. 27 minus 30 is negative 3. Please remember the order matters, okay? So 27 minus 30 is negative 3. We divide that by 1.5, and that is equal to negative 2. Okay, negative 2 what? Here is below. Yeah. What it, what it is is that this sample mean of 27 is two standard errors below this population mean of 30. And in a normal distribution, that's, that's pretty far below. In fact, if you remember, we'll talk about it in Chapter 8, that would be enough to be statistically significant if you're using uh, your criterion. Okay? All right. We should wrap up chapter six. Are there any other questions from six? I'll give it like five more minutes if you want. Okay, done with six. This is a very strange way of teaching a class, by the way. Writing with my markers in front of me. Okay. Chapter 7 is about estimation. This is our first inferential procedure. The last chapter, Chapter 6, lays the foundation, makes it possible to do inferential statistics by providing a way of going from sample data to population data. But this chapter, estimation, is the first procedure where we actually use sample data to make some sort of conclusion about a population. That's true of also every other chapter we have in the course. All of them are inferential procedures, uh, except all the rest of them are actually hypothesis tests. This is the only one that's not hypothesis test. So we're going to do estimation. You may remember, what is it that you're trying to estimate? You tell me. You know, you get an estimate. It's an estimate of something. What is it an estimation of? Is it a parameter? Yes. What you're doing is you're using a sample statistic to estimate a population parameter. Okay? So we're going to go from a... Sample statistic... And we're going to use that to estimate a population parameter. Like, how much space do I have left? Okay. That's totally illegible. <laughs> population parameter. So, for instance, one really common sample statistic we've dealt with a million times is the mean of the sample, right? And what you can do is you can use the sample mean to estimate the population mean, right? So we're going from the sample to the population. 
Similarly, uh, if you did the sample variance, you could use that to estimate population variance. If you had the um, sample standard deviation, you could use that to estimate the population standard deviation, so on and so forth. These are the only ones we use that have different symbols for uh, the two so far. There are others, you know, when we get to later, you can use a sample regression coefficient to estimate a population one, and you can use a sample correlation coefficient to estimate. That is not a P, that's a row. That's a lowercase r. It looks like a P. Anyhow, so we, you can use the sample statistic to estimate the population parameter, okay? The trick is this does not always go well because you're using incomplete information. You only have some data, but you're not making a conclusion about everything. So, for instance, you know, um, if you're trying to, if I'm trying to test you guys, see how much you learned about statistics, it would be wrong for me to ask you 80 questions about the order of operations, right? That would tell me about the order of operations. It would be a biased sample, and it would not tell me about what you know about statistics in general. It's part of it. It goes into it, and it's a very fundamental thing in algebra. But you need to watch out, because if you're not sampling well, then whatever you get from the sample is not going to generalize well. And as you saw in the book, there's some very famous, his, you know, and in the, in the videos, there's some very famous examples of people messing up completely when they go from sample to population. A really interesting one is in just a few more days, we're going to have elections. We have people running for a lot of local offices, and we have some people running for uh, House of Representatives. We're going to elect somebody to Congress. And the way that people campaign depends a lot on who they think they need to influence and what they think they need to tell them in order to influence them. I've said this a thousand times. I'll say it again. I, I believe that the 2012 presidential election turned out the way it did in part because the Romney campaign was using bad data. They were using biased samples in trying to estimate how well received they were. If they had tried to go for accurate data as opposed to data that looked good, they would have changed their strategy. And they, you guys may not recall, you know, the, the popular vote was close in 2012. The, the, uh, the con the Electoral College was two to one, but the popular vote was really close. And I think it's because they were using biased data, whereas the Obama team was going very far out of their way to make sure that they had unbiased estimates. And so, you know, you tell yourself, okay, I don't need to go to Western Ohio anymore because that one's, you know, wrapped up. I can go somewhere else and spend my time there. It's gonna make a difference. And again, I've said this a million times before. I believe that mistake will never, ever happen again. It will never happen again. And right now, in, our, in the congressional race, you know Mia Love, of course, is a big contender. You remember she barely, barely lost two years ago. Consequently, she has raised an extraordinary amount of money for a congressional race in Utah. I mean, she, she had like nearly $2 million, which is crazy for that, for that office you know, here in Utah. But I think it's also she's paying a lot more attention to what's going on. So we'll see how that one works out, okay? Um, so watch out because when you go from a sample to a population, you can make mistakes if you have a bad sample. And that means that your sample is not representative of the standard for the population. Now, that's not a statistical issue. That's a methodological issue. And sampling is actually a very sophisticated field of study, and there's very 
really interesting stuff that can happen with sampling. If now you guys probably aren't going to become political pollsters, but one of my favorite studies about sampling is how do you estimate population parameters for illegal behaviors? You can't look at criminal records because that just tells you who got caught and convicted. What about can you estimate how many people are actually doing something even if they're not caught? And I know of a couple of studies that have used very, very interesting methods to figure out what percentage of the population is uh, shooting heroin. And it involves very sophisticated sampling techniques that have to also let people feel comfortable volunteering this information. And they have to go through a sort of a network of associates. And then you have to control for the bias that happens early on to try to get to an unbiased sample later. There's also ways to do telephone surveys and ask about questions like, do you use heroin, without putting people on the spot. Um, but those are methodological issues, not statistical ones, per se. Anyhow, we need to talk about estimation. You guys may recall that there's two kinds of estimation we talk about in this uh, chapter. The first one's really easy. First one we talked about. Ooh, that's, that's a skinny marker. The first one we talked about called a point estimate. And a point, you may recall, is sort of this infinitely small zero-dimensional entity. And in statistics, what that means is you're just getting a single number. Population value is probably equal to this. And it's really easy to do because all you do is you take your sample value and you say, okay, the sample mean is the point estimate for the population mean. We just give it a different name. Now, the, the, the place where this becomes different is, uh, this is happens in the political polls, is if you're combining the results of several different polls. Like in a presidential poll, you can get the result of like, you know, 10, 15, 20 different polls. And if you combine them to just a single number, that's a point estimate, right? All that is is a weighted average of, of these other things. And truthfully, that can get sophisticated that they had some very interesting and creative stuff going on creating point estimates in the presidential election. But for what we're doing, it's just simple. Get your sample statistic and say, that is my single best estimate of the population parameter. You don't have any reason to do anything other than your sample statistic. Okay? So that's the easy one. The hard one is the confidence interval. In a confidence interval, you're not just saying that mu is equal to this. What you're doing is you're saying that, for instance, the population mean is somewhere between this high value and this low value. It's somewhere in between. And so what you're doing is you're specifying boundaries. And say, could be as low as this, could be as high as this. And this is where we use z-scores. Because you have to figure out how far away do you go down to get to the low boundary, and how far away do you go up to get to the high boundary. And it depends on a few things. What it depends on, well, let me write the formula. The formula tends to look really long and scary, but that's because it's repetitive. What you're going to do is you're going to start with, for instance, the sample mean. And you're going to put it on both sides. I have to put it down here. So the population mean is somewhere between the sample mean minus a certain amount and the sample mean plus a certain amount. And so let's to get the plus or minus part, you need to add two numbers, or you multiply them. Here's what they are. The first one, and, and the order here doesn't matter, 
I sometimes I write it in a different order. Let me write it as the standard error times a Z score that corresponds to what's called a CL, a confidence level. And so that we add up here. So we're going to, this, this determines how much wiggle room we're adding. And we add it up here and we subtract it down there. See, so here, ready? That and that are the same thing. In fact, these two sides are identical except this one's a plus and this one's a minus. Which is why another way to write it is like this. That the population mean is equal to, you know, whatever, is, is equal to the sample mean plus or minus, oops, the standard error times the CL. So you can also write it this way, kind of a little more condensed. So if you hear a political poll, they'll say like, you know, 57 percentage of respondents plus or minus four points. That's this format. And they got it through a very similar way. Okay. Let's calculate. We have to talk about two things. You guys know how to get a conf sorry. You guys know how to get a standard error. We just did that. That's the standard deviation of the original population divided by the square root of the sample size, right? It's this part that's a little tricky. It's the comp the Z score for the confidence level, all right? This is where we have to go back to our normal distribution, which we've looked at many, many times. All right? So this is z-score. So that's zero right there. That's plus one. That's plus two. That's minus one. That's minus two. Don't forget, by the way, It goes on forever. It's asymptotic. It goes infinitely far to the right. It goes infinitely far to the left. Always getting closer and closer to zero, but never reaching it. It's that Zeno's paradox kind of thing. And, um, but let me ask you guys something really fast. If this is the normal distribution, it's actually the standard normal distribution. Do you guys remember what standard and normal mean? They mean two different things. Tell me. Let's start with the easy one. What does normal mean? What kind of curve? A bell curve. Normal means bell curve, right? That's the shape. What does standard mean? What's that? You know what? When I talked about the standard deviation, it meant that. But we've talked about standardized scores. And the standard normal distribution, it means it has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. You guys may remember, I think there was a quiz question that gives you all this information. If a distribution with a mean of 117 and is bimodal and is, is got a standard deviation, is if every score is standardized, then what is the mean of the new distribution? And you sit there and you like try to calculate stuff. You don't have to calculate anything. If it's standardized, regardless of the shape, the mean is zero, always. And the standard deviation is one, always. None of that other stuff matters. If it's standardized, then those are the answers, okay? And that's why we have to call this the standard normal, because those are two different things. Normal means a bell curve, but an IQ distribution is a bell curve. It's a normal distribution. But it has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So it's, it's got different numbers on the bottom. So the normal mean, the shape, and the standard has to do with the numbers that we write on the bottom, writing z score on the bottom. So you guys tell me something right now. What percentage of the distribution is between here and here? Yeah. These are numbers you have to memorize. What percentage of the normal distribution is between here and here? 34. 34%. 34%. 
And don't forget, if you know those two numbers, you can get everything else. The reason you can do that is because it's symmetrical, right? So if this is 34 right here between 0 and 1, then this is also 34 here between 0 and negative 1. And if this is 14 here between 1, minus 1 and 2, then this is 14 also. And each half adds up to 50, so this has to be 2%, and this has to be 2%, right? If you can remember 34 and 14, you can get the rest. By the way, these numbers are, are rounded off, okay? Because this number down here is closer to 2.25, but we're not going to worry about that. Um, or 2.24 or something like that. So, we need to get a z-score to get a confidence level. And the way the confidence level works is you basically have to say, what proportion of the normal distribution do I want to cover? If you only want to cover 68%, that means you want to be 68% confident. Really what it is, is it means that 68% of your samples would have confidence intervals that were within a certain range. 68% is between here and here, right? So 68 goes from plus 1 to minus 1. So in that case, if we come back to this for a moment, you would put a 1 right there. Because uh, what you need is the absolute value of the z-score you're going to use. So we use 1. If you wanted to do a 95.4, or th the way we have things rounded off a 96% confidence interval, you would go from here up to there, right? You would use 2. And so that's the number that you would put right there. Or there, or there, okay? So the confidence level is a way of saying how certain do I want to be that the population value really is between my high and my low. And you get that from the normal distribution. So the most common is 95%. That's, it's an arbitrary choice. It could be anything else, but it's such an incredibly strong history to that one, that you use the 95% unless you have some sort of super compelling reason to use something else. So 95%, the plus and minus 2 is really close to 95%. It's actually 95.4. You guys remember the magic value to get 95% bracketed? You should remember this. <laughs> What's that? Yes. That number puts 95% in the middle, plus and minus 1.96. If you go to 2 and minus 2, it's only a tiny bit larger, 95.4. But a lot of people get bent out of shape if you use 2. They want you to use 1.96. Um, so if you want to do a 95% confidence interval, the 1.96 is what you would stick right there, and there, or there. Okay. If you wanted to do a different level of confidence, like a 90% or a 99.9%, you would use a different value of Z. On the quizzes and on the exams, I will tell you two things. I'll always say, compute an 80% confidence interval using a Z-score of 1.64. So I will tell you both the confidence level and the Z-score to use, so you don't have to look it up. You just have to know how to plug it in. Okay. Yes. So the confidence level, do you plug it in? What is the? The Z score. Z for the conf the Z score for the confidence, the confidence level. level the yeah. So let me show you. We'll run through an example. All right. We'll see how you, how everything plugs in. So let's make up some numbers. That would be great. Which one is it? Okay, 
Quiz for chapter seven, quiz number one, question number four. Okay, we have a sample of 25 scores, a mean of 55, a population standard deviation of 10, Okay, so this is the stuff that we're given. We're given a sample size, a sample mean, a population standard deviation. Now, I know that sounds really weird. You might say, how on earth can you know the population standard deviation without knowing the population mean? Um, the answer is usually you don't. And usually you use the sample standard deviation instead. But you can't use the normal distribution in that case. You have to use something called the t-distribution, which we will talk about in chapter 9. But we're not going to do confidence intervals with it. But anyhow, sometimes you can actually calculate what the population standard deviation should be uh, just from theory. You know, like if, if you're doing something that's uh, like a, if you play, uh, if, you, if you play 62 games in a season and you have, what would the standard deviation be if you had a 25% chance of winning? You can calculate that. Anyhow, so we have the sample size, the sample mean, the population standard deviation, and our confidence level. This is one that you choose, right? These are calculated or given. This one you choose. And this time it says do a 95% confidence level, and it also specifies use a z-score of plus or minus 1.96. So we, that stuff's all given to us. All right, ready? Let's do it this way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it down a little differently. I'm going to do it this way. What we're trying to estimate, by the way, is the population mean. It, does, it says that, right? Okay. So what we're going to estimate is the population mean, mu. And in this case, mu is equal to x bar, the sample mean, plus or minus a certain amount of space, which is given by the standard error times the z-score for our confidence level, okay? So, some of the stuff we can plug in immediately. The sample mean we have, it's 55. This one right here, the standard error, I'll come back to that in just a second. I'm going to scoot ahead for just a moment to the z-score for the confidence level. That's going to be 1.96. We need the standard error, but that's really easy to get. Like every other time we've done it, it's just equal to the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. In that case, in this case, that's 10 divided by the square root of 25. That's 10 over 5, which is 2. Okay, that's the standard error. So I take that and I put it in right here. Okay. So my population mean is equal to 55 plus or minus 2 times 1.96, which is 3.92. Okay? Then all you got to do is, so this would be like a, again, this would be like a political poll, 55 plus or minus 4, we, except we have 3 point, plus or minus 3.92. Now, this is one way to report the results. You could leave it like this, 55 plus or minus this. That's our 95% confidence interval for the population mean. On the other hand, it's more common to actually run through the calculate in the scientific world, it's more common to actually say what the lower and upper limits are. So we do 55 minus 3.92, which is going to be mm, 51.08. And then we add it, and that's going to be 58.92. And it's common to put them in parentheses with a comma between them, and you, and you write it like this, 0.95ci for confidence interval. You can also write it as a sentence, and I give that as an example. You can say the 95% confidence interval for the population mean ranged from this number to this number. Yes? Yes? 
Okay, I better write this stuff down. Ready? Okay. Which which question is it? Seven one five. Okay, so chapter seven, quiz one, number five. Question. So we have sample A. And what's it tell us about sample A? Okay, so this is pretty easy because it's not throwing in too many other numbers. It's just asking which one will have a narrower confidence interval. Ready? It has to do with this. Which one's going to have a smaller standard error? Be well, oh, you know what? That's the degrees of freedom, and that's going to show up in some other stuff, but not right now. What it is is the standard error, that the way the... Um, Bigger samples make smaller standard errors because the, sta because the sample size goes in the denominator, right? The same way that 1 over 1,000 is a smaller number than 1 over 100 is smaller than 1 over 10. Um, so bigger sample, smaller standard error, and smaller standard error, all else being equal, smaller standard error means narrower confidence interval. Yes. The confidence interval, the width of the confidence interval, that has to do with this part right here. You know that number, the plus or minus we're adding? But that has to do with the standard error. And the standard error has to do with the sample size. So there's a chain of effects, right? So when this number here gets bigger, the overall ratio gets smaller. And when you put a smaller number in right here, then the amount that you add and subtract is going to be smaller. And that means a narrower confidence interval because you're not going as far away from the mean in either direction. I'll tell you something else. There's an intuitive way to think about this. Ready? You guys know um, the, the simple one. If you... Um, if you flip a coin five times, you could get all heads or all tails, right? It's not that big a deal. You flip it 10, it's possible, but it's rare. You flip it 100 times, that's just not going to happen. Or this can be like 1 in you know, like 79 billion trillion million or something. It's just not going to happen. And that's because the sample size is increasing, and that means that the range of reasonable values gets narrower and narrower and narrower. Another place that this happens is in sports. Um, like I said, right now, it's, it's the World Series. They're, they're a few innings into Game 7 of the World Series right now. The nice thing about the World Series is that it's, it's a best of seven series, right? Now, and that's the way it works in, in basketball. They do best of seven, which is why, and they do it for like four levels, and it takes forever to get through the playoffs in basketball. But it's best of seven, and that's good because, you know, anybody can screw up on one night or maybe even two nights, and you can still kind of pull it together. And you tend to get a pretty good image of who's the better team when you do a best of seven. Where this is really hard is in football because you only play each other once. And... If something screwy happens in that one game, you know, you're, you're shot. Um, and that's why you can get sort of teams out of nowhere in football because there's so few observation and weird things can happen because there's so much variation allowed because the sample size is really, really small. But in, base, in basketball and in baseball, my other example, by the way, is, is tennis. If any of you play tennis, you know, it, it can take all day to play a match. In fact, I know of, like, you know, sometimes the, the match goes over into the second day. They have to stop it because you have to, you have to win the game, and then you have to win several games to get a, mat, a, a set, and then you have to win several sets to get the match. And what that is is a huge number of observations about who's the better player, which is why, if you, if you follow tennis at all, it's like the same three people all the time who, who win until they get injured or they're, you know, they're just done. 
It's very stable. But in other things, uh, it's not because there's fewer observations. Lots of observations, things get really stable, and the range of possible outcomes becomes really narrow. Small number of observations, weird things can happen. You can get extremes. And then it's similar to confidence intervals. If you have a lot of observations, you're going to get a really precise view of what it is you're estimating. If you have only a few observations, it could be kind of anywhere. And, you know, that's also, you guys ever gone through a job process where you had to get interviewed more than once? I, I know some crazy ones where they have like four levels. You get interviewed so many different times and if they're like a week apart. And, and I think what they're really doing is they're just working on attrition that everybody will just say screw it and they'll just, you know, walk away. And you get to that. But, you know, the idea there is you're getting multiple observations. And somebody might choke on a single interview, but if you do it several times, you'll get a better impression. That's, that's part of the idea. Anyhow. So, larger sample, smaller standard error, narrower confidence interval. Bigger sample, larger standard error, wider confidence interval. That's how that works. All right. What next? I'm getting lightheaded, by the way. <laughs> you have to memorize all of your... You have to memorize everything. Uh, okay, ready? Let me rephrase that. You can't take any notes. <laughs> so you can either memorize it or guess. But you... You know... Almost everything we do at this point is a variation on z-scores. And if you can remember the z-score formula, then your life is easier. Because we do that one a lot. And, you know, it helps to remember that the z-score formula for an individual and the z-score formula for a sample are very closely related. And if it's really too hard for you to remember two different formulas, you can always use the one for a sample just enter a sample size of one. And that'll, then it works for individuals. I mean, it's kind of silly to do it that way, but you can. Because um, then you're dividing by the square root of one, which is one. And the mean of a single score is that score itself. And so it, it simplifies out to, to what it is. But um, You need to remember those few numbers from the, you need to remember the plus or minus 1.96, the 34 and the 14, and you need to remember the z-score formula. I have some formula study sheets that are linked on the syllabus page on Canvas. Look at those, memorize that stuff. Now what? You know what, I, I know what's next. Chapter eight. We have to talk about that, right? Which is the single most confusing chapter in the entire course. And the problem with this one is not so much that it's computationally difficult, it's just hard to follow the logic. And when you read the questions, it's, it, it sounds like a pretzel. You know, it's like, if this is going this way, and this is going this way, and this is going this way, then what happens over here? And you're like, I have no idea. Um, hypothesis testing. This is chapter 8. Chapter 7, which we just barely finished talking about on estimation, is, an, is the first inferential procedure that we talked about where you're trying to get data from a sample and make a conclusion about a population, right? Chapter 8 is also an inferential procedure where, again, you're trying to take information from a sample and make a conclusion about a population. The difference is in estimation, you're trying to say, what's the most likely value for the population parameter that you're interested in, like the mean? In hypothesis testing, you're ending up with a yes or no decision. It, it dichotomizes. That's called dichotomizing. It's a dichotomy. A lot of people say dichotomy when they mean paradox. Dichotomy means two possible values. And it's a dichotomous decision, yes, no. 
Or, if you remember, the terms actually are reject the null hypothesis versus fail to reject the null hypothesis. You can also word it as retain the null hypothesis. But we either reject it or we don't reject it. Okay? And what you're trying to do here is you can say, we're going to see if there's a difference between uh, the test that we're going to use in this chapter is the one sample Z test. So what we're doing is we're looking at a sample mean and we're comparing it to a population mean. And all we're trying to say is, is this sample mean close to the population mean or far away from it? That's all we're doing. Is it close or is it far? Where the line that you draw between close and far is calculated and it corresponds to, for instance, the confidence level that we use. And, um, but that's basically, is it close or is it far? Is it a little or is it a lot? Is it small or is it big? And especially, is it too big? Is it likely to happen by chance? Or is it not likely to happen by chance? Does it have a high probability of occurring through a random process or a low probability of occurring through a random process? That's several different ways of saying the same thing. So um, let's think. OK, let me just run through a calculation. I'll give you an example. Um, oh, we had a z-score a moment ago. We did a z-score. We did a z-score somewhere. OK. Here's a z-score that we did from chapter 6. OK. So what we had here is we had a sample of four scores, and that sample had a mean of 27, and we're comparing it to a population with a mean of 30 and a standard deviation of 3, right? Here's the question. Is this mean close to the 30, or is it far away? It depends on two things. It depends on the standard error because that gives us our measuring stick. That's, you know, we're going to say we, we measure the distance in standard errors. And then we have to draw a line somewhere that says how far is too far. We have to draw a line between big and small, close and far away. And the way we draw that line is with, the, um, is with this. Once upon a time, the guy who invented hypothesis testing, his name was Ronald Fisher, was an agricultural researcher. He put together this logic, and it works this way. In this particular case, we're going to say that this right here is called a null distribution. Null means empty or nothing, right? And what it means is that we assume there is no difference between our sample and the population, or that any difference we do see is just random, meaningless, fluky variation. And we shouldn't conclude anything by it. Because, you know, um, if you guys flip a coin 10 times, and then you flip it again 10 times, you're not going to get the same answer both times, probably. But it doesn't mean that you like somehow figured out how to flip a coin better in between the two times, you know, because we know it's a random process. Um, so the null distribution is based on the idea that most of the time, the difference between the sample mean and the population mean is going to be zero, or it's going to be really close to zero. But sometimes the sample will be higher, sometimes the sample will be lower, okay? And that happens through random variation. It doesn't mean anything. What Fisher proposed was simply a number. He says, how about we take 95% as the cutoff between close and far? That the middle 95% of the distribution is close. And anything further away than that is far. Okay. So if you're using the normal distribution, that means a cutoff of plus 1.96 or minus 
So let's go back for just a moment to this one. We got a z-score here of minus 2. Okay? If we're using a cutoff of plus or minus 1.96, our 2 is past that. In fact, this is the way you would normally draw it. You would come here to the 1.96 and you go boop, 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 boop. And the region that I just shaded off in red on each side, you call the critical region or the region of rejection. And the idea is that if your sample value gets into the red, it's too far away. It's like you're driving your car and you gas it in neutral by accident. The tachometer shoots up into the red. Too high. Don't do that. This says too far. We no longer assume that it's just chance variation. So our sample value of negative 2 does, in fact, fall into this region of rejection, just barely. But it's outside of the middle 95%. Now, it's true that if we, instead of using 95%, we used 96%, this two would be on the inside. And now, nobody uses 96, but people do use 99. Uh, where the cutoff is, is something like, uh, I think it's like 2.58. If we use 99, this would be considered not big. But you guys understand, that's an arbitrary choice. You get to choose what, you know, how much is too much, right? Most of the time, 95% is considered adequate. In certain things where it really makes a big difference, they'll use a number like 99.9 .9 or something like that to say, no, it's got to be really big before we assume that something's going on here. And um, that is a hypothesis test. And so what we're saying is, yeah, that, that value of minus 2 could arise by chance. But a value that far away from 0 happens by chance less than 5% of the time. And because we chose this 95 versus 5% thing, we're going to conclude that that's just too big to happen uh, by random chance. Does that make sense? How much is too much? We drew a line. It went past the line. That being said, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. I'll emphasize again. The choice of your cutoff is arbitrary, though there's a strong professional practice of using the 5%. I, I talk about it sometimes as 5% and I, or, or 95%. You understand those are complements of each other. That means the middle 5%, 95% versus the extreme 5%. If we used a different value, we would reach a different conclusion. And some people get a little bit out of shape about that. I have an analogy for it, and maybe I talked about it online. But um, any of you familiar with how a court of law works when you do a trial? Because in our American system, we have criminal trials and we have civil trials. And they use different standards of evidence. In a criminal trial, you guys know what the standard is? Okay. Beyond the shadow of a doubt. It's not a number, right? It's a phrase. You have to be certain beyond the shadow. You have to be like totally certain that this person did this thing before you convict them. You've got to be totally certain. You might say it's equivalent to being 99.9% .9 sure. You have to think there's almost no way that you could be mistaken. A civil trial, however, is different. A civil trial, you're not trying to determine whether somebody committed a crime or not. You're usually trying to determine whether somebody owes somebody else money. And in that case, the standard, you guys know what the standard is in a civil trial? It's a funny, another funny little term, good for Scrabble, a preponderance of evidence. And all that means is you have to be more certain than uncertain. I mean, in this case, the cutoff is 50%. If you're 51% certain that it happened, the person can be found uh, liable in a civil trial. But in a criminal trial, you have to be 99.9% .9 certain. That's why, if you guys are old enough, you remember the O.J. Simpson case. 
he was not convicted in the criminal case of killing his wife, even though everybody in the whole world believed he did it. it it's saying if we were using the 99.9%, I think we got up to like 99.8%, and it just didn't quite cross that line. But you guys may remember that trial went on for forever, but there was a civil trial afterwards, and he got nailed immediately in the civil trial um, because they use a very different standard. And they said, yeah, it's more than 50% likely that you did it. And there, were, there was no doubt about it. And in terms of, they were more, they thought it was more likely to have happened than not have happened. That's like shifting the cutoffs we use in hypothesis testing. Yeah, it's true. Sometimes this negative two will be considered an extreme value depending on where you draw the line. Sometimes it won't be an extreme value depending on where you draw the line. It's entirely about the standard that you use. And what it means is when you do your research, you have to be very clear about what your standard is and why you chose it. So people get, and then you also say what your number was. So if somebody's reading your research and they said, you know what, you shouldn't have used that cutoff. You should have used this cutoff instead. They can then make their own conclusion based on what you had. They can reach, so that's, that's considered a responsible thing. Um, I mentioned a second ago, this is the null distribution. And this is the distribution of possible outcomes when nothing is happening. It's like flipping a coin a hundred times. Yes, it's possible to get 60 heads. It's possible to get 70 or 80 heads. It's possible to get 100 heads. It's just that's so incredibly unlikely that after a certain point, we're going to conclude that it's, you know, if you, if you got 80 heads in 100 flips, I would conclude that something was wrong. Either you had a weighted coin or you were not telling me the truth. More likely that you were not telling me the truth or that you lost count. Um, this is the same as hypothesis testing and it opens up a few possibilities that we need to talk about. What these are is a little table we can draw. Okay, here's the deal. We have data from a sample. That's the only data that we have. You can't have data from a population. You can only have data from a sample. I understand in, in textbooks they talk about situations where you have population data. That doesn't happen in real life. You have sample data. So you have information from a sample. And what you're looking for is an effect. And that is, how far away is it from this hypothesized zero value? So I'm going to call that a sample effect. And if there is a sample effect, that means that your sample is, is different from the population. If there's not a sample effect, it means it does not appear to be different. Okay? So in this case, the yes would mean that you were way off in this uh, red region, and the no would mean that you're somewhere in between. Okay? Now, I had to draw a box because that's what happens from the sample, but there's also whether there is a population effect. So you have some data, and this is what's happening in all of the data, if you were able to get that. That could be a yes or a no also. So, four possibilities here. The first one is that you found an effect in your sample and that that effect accurately represents an effect that exists in the population. Okay, that's a good thing. That's called a true positive or just a hit. Okay, that's fine. That's good. It means you found something that's really there. Down in this corner, you can have no sample effect. So you can't see anything going on in the sample, and that's because there's nothing going on in the population. There's no effect there. That is a true negative. Both of those are accurate conclusions because your sample accurately reflected the population. Right? The problem is these two cells right here, these two boxes. 
So for instance, maybe your, your sample data showed an effect. But for whatever reason, that's not really happening in the real world. In fact, there's no effect in the real world. And so what you have there is a false positive. Positive means that you found a sample effect. False because it's not an accurate reflection of the population. False positive, very bad. And that means that down here, you had no sample effect, but you did see, a, but there really is an effect in the population. That would be a false negative. That's also bad. These both have names, by the way. Now, I think false positive and false negative are the, I, those are the names I wish they used because they have entirely unuseful names. That is a type 1 error, a false positive, and a false negative. It's a type 2 error. The only way I can remember this and I have to do this every single time, despite the fact that I've been working in statistics and teaching it for 20 years, is I have to go positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, one, two, one, two, one, two, positive, negative. I always say positive before I say negative, and I always say one before I say two. So I just have to remember that they come in that order. If you can find some other mnemonic, great, but I have to use that. So that's why I prefer saying false positive and false negative. But the terms type 1 and type 2 errors come up all the time, including on the final exam. So make sure you can remember what's a type 1 and a type 2. Um, now here's the trick. You can never know for sure if you have a true positive or a false positive. And you can never know for sure if you have a true negative or a false negative. You can't know. But you can get probabilities. That's the sort of the best you can do in this situation. Now the probability of a type 1 error is, uh, is easy because it's a number that you get to pick. And the probability of this has a, has a symbol. This is a new Greek symbol for us. It's a lowercase alpha. It looks a little bit like a fish or, an, a, or a cursive A. I didn't draw it very well, but what's that? No, it's not. It it it's technically. I think if I draw it really well, it looks more like that. But that's an alpha. It's a lowercase Greek a, and that's a symbol for the probability of a type one error, assuming that there is nothing going on in the population. Or in other words, assuming that the null distribution is the right one. You see this area that I've shaded off in red? That's a, an area that says, yeah, these things can happen in the null distribution. It's a legitimate part of the null distribution. It's just a really small part. 95% of the time, stuff's going to be in between. And so it turns out that you get to pick the probability that you want, and far and away the most common is 0.5, which is 5%. And so if you're doing what's called a non-directional or two-tailed test, you take that 5% and you split it into two pieces, part of it on the high end, part of it on the low end. So this piece right there, that is alpha divided by 2 which is in, most often is 0.05 divided by 2, which is equal to 0 0.025, which is equal to 2.5%. <coughs> Four ways of saying the same thing. Three of them, you can see the math, though. Similarly, the same thing down here. This one down here is also alpha divided by 2, which is usually 0 0.05 divided by 2, which is equal to 0 0.025, which is if you write it as a percentage, is 2.5%. Same thing here and here. And so the null distribution means nothing's happening, that there's no population effect. That corresponds to this column right here. And so you can't really say 
whether it's a mistake or not, but you can choose a value that makes a false positive pretty unlikely. Okay? The trick is this one, the false negative, because you can't just pick it. You can pick any value you want over here, though you better have a good reason if you're choosing something other than 05. Here, you don't pick it, you calculate it. The probability of a type 2 error, assuming that there is a population effect, it's a conditional probability. It only applies for these two things in this one column. This one, the alpha, only applies for those. Okay? It's a conditional probability. It's a, it's, you have to make an assumption about what's happening in the population first, right? So you could, be, you could make a mistake because you're making an assumption. But you have to. You have to make an assumption in order to get a probability. This one, the probability goes by another Greek letter. Eh, it's usually a little more vertical than that. That's a beta. And it's a lowercase Greek B. Alpha, beta. Chi, delta, epsilon. Well, anyhow. Um, And the probability of a type 2 error is a function of three things. Number one, it is a function of alpha. There is a direct trade-off. If you don't like your type 2 error, your value here, you can pick a different alpha. But you know what? You don't mess with that. And you certainly never make it more lenient because then people think that you're lying. Number two is it's a function of what you can call the effect size. I write ES for effect size. That's the difference between the two groups, for instance. So, you know, we might have it where we have two groups. And we have one group that's over here with a mean like that. And we have another group. It's over here with a mean like that, right? So we got a difference that's this big. That's the effect size, right? Because you know you can also have it like this. And in that case, the effect size is much smaller. The difference between the means is much smaller. And when you have a small effect size, when you've got a lot of overlap, you're going to have more false positives. Excuse me, more false negatives. You're going to have more false negatives. You're going to have more type 2 errors when there's overlap. So bigger effect size, you just pick up the distributions and move them apart. That's easier to deal with. Now, in most situations, there's nothing you can do. You can't pick up the distributions and move them. If you're doing observational research, and the vast majority of research is observational, you know, the difference between left-handed and right-handed people just is what it is. You have to leave it there. Um, I'll give you a bizarre little tip. Are any of you left-handed? Okay. Did you know that the corpus callosum is proportionally larger in left-handed people than it is in right-handed people? That's the bundle of nerve that connects the two hemispheres. It is also proportionally larger in women than it is in men. And so left-handed women will have the biggest corpus callosum of all. Better interhemispherical communication. Also means you'd be less susceptible to a stroke. That's good. Um, anyhow, but let's say we're looking, oh, here's what I'm going to tell you. The association between smell and memory is apparently affected by whether you're right-handed or left-handed. I don't know why. I just know that one of my grad school professors who was doing that could only have right-handed people in his study. So, go figure. Okay, so let's say you're comparing left-handed and right-handed people, right? That's an observational study. The difference just is what it is. You can't make left-handed people, right-handed people more different. They're just, they're just what they are. And so, you, a lot of times you can't affect the, you can't do anything about the effect size. In an experiment, however, you can. Now, manipulated experiments, while they're, it's common to talk about them in the research world, they actually constitute a very small amount of research overall. 
Um, a manipulated experiment means that you're causing something to happen. So, for instance, if you're looking at the association between smell and memory, okay, don't give them just a little bit of something to smell. You know, like dump out the whole bottle. Make the smell really strong. And then you should be able to see the difference between different smells really easily. It, it, it's, it's called just jacking up the manipulation. Make it as strong as you possibly can. And that means take, if they're, over, if they're close naturally, just push them as far apart as you possibly can. Um, I know about studies that have looked at uh, the effect of um, you know, frustration on a person's performance. And, but this is, w this is within an experimentally manipulated project where they are, are intentionally frustrating the participants. So you don't frustrate them a little bit. You frustrate them as much as you possibly can because you want to see the effect. You want to make it as big as possible. So in those situations, you can reduce your false negative rate by, by reducing the overlap by simply moving the distributions apart from each other. Overlap is bad. But like I said, in most situations, you can't do that. Because if you're comparing left-handed, right-handed, or you're comparing you know, men and women, or if you're comparing uh, whatever, people just, you know, they just are what they are, and you've got to deal with it. The third thing that goes into calculating the beta, which is the type 2 error rate, is the sample size. Because it goes into the standard error. And here's the deal with that one. Take, for instance, these two right here. And let's assume those are with small samples. Because what we're talking about here are sampling distributions. Let's say these are small samples. You know what you can do? Make your life a little easier? Get bigger samples. And when you get bigger samples, remember like the confidence interval thing we talked about? Bigger sample, smaller standard error, narrower confidence interval. It also means narrower distribution. And so if you get a much bigger sample, then you see that you have almost no overlap. Bigger samples shrink the distributions. You have less overlap. So that's a good thing. It makes it easier to find the effect in the population without making a mistake. Now, the moral of that story is that when it comes to reducing false positives, just pick a different number. If you, if you feel that 05 is too high, go to 01, right? If 5% is too much, just choose 1%. That's your prerogative. You can do it. This one, however, if you feel, and by the way, um, there's been some really good research that says, you know, people don't calculate their, their, their um, false negative probability usually in the research. But when people have gone back and looked at published research, they say, oh my goodness, you had like a 50% chance of a false positive, excuse me, of a false negative in your research. That's an enormous effect. That's a bad, an enormous bad thing. And what they said is, well, you know, you don't want to change the alpha because that's considered bad form. You don't want to, meaning you don't want to make it more lenient. You don't want to go from 5% to 10%. That would be bad. You may not be able to change the effect size, but the one thing you, you almost always have control over is the sample size. Bigger samples mean smaller standard errors, mean narrower confidence intervals, mean narrower sampling distributions, mean less false negatives. So, whenever possible, or whenever feasible, get as big a sample size as you can. Now, in some situations, that's really super easy. If what you're measuring is clicks on web ads, you can get data from millions or hundreds of millions or even billions of clicks in like, you know, a day or two. It's, it's kind of embarrassing how much data you can get if you're working with stuff on the web. Uh, not just naturally occurring behavior, watching how people click on this side or the other. If you're doing medical research and you're using MRIs or you're using like stem cell research, 
you're going to have single digit samples and there's almost nothing you can do about that because it's so slow, it's so expensive, it's so time consuming, it's so difficult to do. In the social sciences, if you're doing like a survey study, you don't really have that problem. It just, it just takes time to gather the data. Now, I, I'll mention, I once upon a time had some students who said that they took a class from a teacher in a different department, which shall remain unnamed, and they required their students to get data from 400 people on their survey. I go like, that's insane. And they said, and it's because the professor told them 400 makes it scientific. I said, no, that just makes it large. Scientific and large are not the same thing. Because if you have a biased sample, making it larger actually just gives you a false sense of confidence. You think, I must have good data because it's large. No, if, it, if, it's, if it's a crappy sampling method, it's going to stay crappy. You're just going to think that you got it right. And that's bad, bad, bad. Um, so I never made that requirement. You know, when I, I used to teach experimental psychology and research methods, I don't anymore. But most of our studies had samples between, say, you know, 40 and 80. Because that's, you can gather that data in a couple of days. It's enough for most purposes. It's, it's not too time consuming. If it's your master's thesis or your dissertation, you're going to probably want to try to get a few hundred. But, you know, get as much as is reasonable for your, for your project, okay? Anyhow. We've got 13 minutes left. Yes? Yes, Cohen's D is a measure of effect size. Let me show you the relationship between the two, okay? It's what it, what it is, is uh, effect size is a general category, and Cohen's D is one thing within that category. Um, it works this way. If you're comparing means, uh, if you're comparing the mean of one sample to a population or one sample to another, but if you're just comparing two means, then Cohen's D is a really good choice because it's very similar to the Z-score. The z-score, you remember, looks like this, because I've already drawn it like eight times tonight. Right? You get the sample mean. You find out how far it is from the population mean. That's the, that's the deviation of the difference. And you divide it by the standard error. This is used in inferential statistics. If you want to do an hypothesis test, you've got to use this one, right? Cohen's D, on the other hand, which is often written with a lowercase d, it looks very similar with one major difference. It uses the standard deviation instead of the standard error. And I know that looks like a really small difference, but what it makes it a profoundly different thing because this is good for describing the size of the differences between groups. It ignores sample size. And if you just want to say, you know, this group was one standard deviation above that group, that makes sense if you understand what a standard deviation is. That's easy to, to interpret. When it's influenced by sample size, the z-score is a function of both the difference here and the sample size. And it's hard to, so if you have a big z-score, you don't know if it's because you have a big difference or if because you have a big sample size. Now, that doesn't mean that this, that's bad because you have to do that for inferential testing. It's usually you want to do the both of them. This, you would use Cohen's to say, this is how big the difference between the groups was. And the z-score is used to give you the probability of that difference arising by chance. So you use both of them, but they, they answer different questions, even though they look really similar. But Cohen's D is just one measure of effect size. We'll talk about a few others in the, um, in the, in the next few chapters. Yeah? Uh, how do you know it'll tell you. Oh, okay. Yeah, it'll usually say, what is Cohen's D in this situation, or what is the Z-score? Okay. 
But if you're doing an inferential test, if you need a probability value, if you're doing a hypothesis test, you're going to use the z-score. This is the one you use for inferential testing and hypothesis tests. This is used for, this is a descriptive statistic. This is an inferential statistic.